Welcome to our special coverage of the Noor Salman trial here on ClickOrlando.com. I'm Bridget Ellison. The U.S. government has laid out its case against the Pulse gunman's widow, Noor Salman, during opening statements this morning. Salman is accused of knowing her husband's plan and doing nothing to stop it. Let's bring in News 6's Nadine Yanis. She'll be in the courtroom for the duration of the trial. Joining us live now from the federal courthouse in downtown Orlando. Of course, a big day today, Nadine, for the defense and prosecution. That's right, Bridget, and both sides started off strong in their opening statements, which are basically a legal roadmap for the jury to tell them where their case is going to go. The government, starting with setting the scene inside the Pulse nightclub, saying, uh, talking about one survivor that we're expected to hear from and how he pretended to lay dead for three hours. The government says that we, that the people inside the Pulse nightclub that night didn't know about the horror that was going to take place, but the two people that did know pointed at the defendant, Nor Salman, says was Nor Salman and her husband, Omar Mateen. But then the defense also started off strong. Her attorney looking at the jury and says that Nor Salman was a mother, that Omar Mateen was the monster, and Salman's only sin was that she married that monster. The government's opening statements was all about Salman's help with the preparation of the attack, they say. Talking about the trips they took, the government saying they have evidence Salman was with Mateen casing venues like City Place in West Palm Beach, the House of Blues at Disney Springs, and Pulse itself. The government also bringing in that confession. 12 pages, they say, is of Salman's own words, saying she wished she could go back and tell Mateen's family and the police what he was going to do. Then they talked about text messages the jury will see showing what they say is Salman's cover story. But the defense opened up that Salman wasn't preparing for an attack, believing Mateen's spending of things on her and buying tickets for her to go home to California was that her abusive life and marriage was starting to take a turn. They also say the unrecorded confession wasn't her own words, but coerced by the FBI, and that their evidence will show Salman is in the 98 percentile of those susceptible to giving a false confession. And at the defense, at the end of the defense's opening statements, Linda Moreno, when asking for the jury to find her client not guilty, said that the only true justice in this case and the only way to honor the dead and respect the living is to find the truth. So obviously, strong opening statements today. They took, both took about an hour each. And then we had our first government witness called. It was an OPD officer, Adam Gruler. He was the first officer to confront Omar Mateen working at the Pulse Night club uh, off duty. He became emotional on the stand today talking about how time froze when he thought it was just a regular club shooting, not realizing that the shots wouldn't stop. And inside that courtroom was Christine Leinenen. Her son Drew was killed in the Pulse attack and she was just wiping away her tears listening to what has already been emotional testimony today, Bridget. And Nadine, those are tough details to hear. It sounds like there were a lot of victims' family members there. And so we have seen several of them, many of the victims' families telling me they want to be here, not so much to find out what happens to Salman in the end, as they are to find out about what happened inside that Pulse nightclub attack and how their loved ones died. Take a look at who we saw uh, coming into court. We've already seen Pulse owner Barbara Poma here during jury selection. She was back here today walking into court with a group of people, uh, including Tara Connell. Her son, Corey Connell, uh, was killed in the Pulse attack. If you remember, he was from college park worked at the Publix there. She also says that she wanted to be here uh, to find out answers as to how Corey died. And then of course, Christine Leinenen, who we mentioned. Also inside the courtroom, I saw My Myra Alviar. Her daughter, Amanda Alviar, was also killed in the attack. So the courtroom was packed again today, uh, both on both sides. Nor Salman's family was also here, and we already have witness testimony underway. This trial taking its place today at the federal courthouse. Okay, Nadine Giannis live for us at the federal courthouse in downtown Orlando with the latest. We'll let you get back to it and we'll check back in with you later. Thank you so much. And joining us now here in studio, News 6 legal analyst Jason Johnson from the Lowndes Law Firm. Thanks for being here again. Always my pleasure, Bridget. So it sounds like uh, these opening statements tried to set the scene and, and set the tone for the, the trial ahead. Yeah, they did exactly what I expected them to do. First, the U.S. government laid out its case against Ms. Salman and set forth the evidence that they expect to admit into court. 
showing that she not only knew, and they have to convince the jury that not only did she know, but that she actually took some steps to assist Mr. Mateen in uh, perpetrating this attack. And so it's not enough to show that she simply knew about it and didn't do anything. They have to show that she actually aided and abetted. Uh, the jury doesn't have to believe every single theory of their aiding and abetting argument. They only have to believe one. And you can have different jurors believing one and different jurors believing the other. So long as all 12 of them believe she did it, she's going to be found guilty. Um, the defense did exactly what I expected them to do, which is to say that the government has the burden of proof. And here are the reasons why we think reasonable doubt exists. And they went through a litany of items like um, the statement uh, having incorrect information not being supported by forensic evidence. But they also try to play to some of the emotion involved. Uh, Ms. Moreno started her comments by saying, Omar Mateen is a monster. Uh, nor Salman is a mother, not a monster, and that her only sin was having uh, married Mr. Mateen. They're trying to play her as the innocent spouse who knew nothing about this. Not only did she not aid and abet, but that she didn't know and that uh, everything she said in her statement was coerced. The government got her to say exactly what they wanted. Uh, it's in the government's handwriting. Yes, she makes some comments at the end, but these are really their words, not hers. I think they're going to have a tough time getting the jury to buy that completely. She made some comments in her opening about uh, Ms. Salmon having uh, an IQ of 84, which would be below average uh, on any reasonable scale. And I think they're going to try to paint her as somebody who didn't know what she was doing. Uh, she was pressured by a number of FBI agents, and she just said whatever they wanted her to say. And when we look at the witnesses they're going to be calling, what do you expect to happen today with that? Well, the government's witness list that they uh, filed with the court has primarily uh, law enforcement uh, members as witnesses. They do also list uh, Ms. Salmon's brother as a witness. But we've already seen the first witness called today who was not on the government's witness list, and it was the officer who was working off duty at Pulse the evening of the attack. And we've already heard, you know, we had some questions before the trial started. Are we going to learn anything new during the course of the trial? We've already heard testimony from the first witness that is new information, that uh, he engaged Mr. Mateen, Mr. Mateen's AR-15 to Sig Sauer, I think it's the MCX weapon that he bought, jammed. And that's what forced him to retreat into the bathroom. That's information we didn't know before. There was also emotional testimony from that officer that after he retreated, uh, from the Pulse nightclub as a result of thinking that Mr. Mateen may have some explosives on him. He actually witnessed two males attempting to flee the club who were gunned down right before his eyes. So we've already heard some emotional testimony, new information about how the attack went down. And I think that's what may give some of the families that are there a bit of closure. And there's limited seating there. It sounds like lots of people are coming who have a personal connection to this, victims, family members. Um, taking up a, a lot of those seats there. Yeah, I expect the first few days of the trial that's going to be the case. We have a lot of people who are very emotionally invested mm -hmm. uh, in the attack. Uh, they want to come see what is happening. And they've been waiting a long time for this trial to begin. And now that it's finally started, they're going to want to get their chance to be there. I expect that that'll taper off in the coming days. Mm -hmm. It'll be primarily media, but you'll have some people who want to come take a look at what's going on and how things are going. Yeah, it seems like everyone's looking for more answers or hoping to glean more information. Uh, maybe new information could emerge. That's true, and I think they're going to get some of that. And looking at the jury, this is our first look at the jury, uh, 12 women, 6 men. Um, what are the odds that it is, it's half and half of, of the alternates and then the, the seated jury? We don't know, but it's 2 thirds women. If I had to guess, and we don't know which of those 12 women and six men are the six alternates. I mean, in theory, you could have all six men being the alternates and, and an all-women jury. I think that's highly unlikely and almost an impossibility. If I had to guess, and this would just be a guess, I would say that the makeup of the ultimate 12-member jury will be a little more balanced in terms of male versus female, but I think you're probably going to see more women on the final jury. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to then you'd see men. And could that skew in her favor? Well, I think that's what the defense is hoping, uh, and they're really playing to that with these comments at the beginning that she's a mother trying to take care of their young child, although then you hear testimony that they took their child with them when they went and cased uh, the city place 
uh, venue in Palm Beach. They were out there at 2 a.m. Uh, and they had their three-year-old with them. So that doesn't really look good in terms of you know, her being a caring mother who's doing the best for her young child. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're looking at probably about three weeks of testimony here by all estimates. Yeah, that's what the court is anticipating, and I think we'll probably be somewhere close to that. Maybe a little bit longer. You never know how long people are going to require for cross-examination, but my expectation is we'll be somewhere around that three-week mark. Okay, one day down and... Two weeks and six days to go. Right. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. And because this is a federal trial, no cameras or recording devices are permitted in the courtroom. And News 6 and ClickOrlando.com will have reporters there at the trial for every minute of every day that there are proceedings there. We have a special page detailing everything that's happening on ClickOrlando.com. Look for the North Salmon tab. And join us again tonight at 6.30 for another discussion with News 6 anchor Matt Austin, investigator Mike DeForest, and legal analyst Mark O'Mara. You can watch it live right here again on ClickOrlando.com. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Bridget Ellison.